It's been my pleasure to get to know our next speaker over the last year as a colleague, a podcast host, and a friend. Jennifer French Tomasic is a mental health counselor working with clients across the United States and internationally. She has a master's in the psychology of coercive control, and her personal history includes 11 years in a mystical Christian cult, which she left in 2012. Tonight, Jennifer will be speaking to us about the coercive control often found in high demand, high control church dynamics. Thanks for joining us tonight, Jennifer. Thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy to be with you all. Well, welcome everyone to Court 2020. And this presentation is recognizing coercive control in religious environments. I figured I'd say a little bit about me and won't spend too much time on this, but Jennifer French Tomasic is my name. My business is Jennifer French. I'm an internal family systems level two, two trained counselor. I have research and review currently at Salford University, and that is for my degree in the psychology of coercive control. You can see the name of the research there. If you're at all interested in it, please feel free to inquire or be in touch. I am also in the midst of a certification in post-call counseling. I partly wanted to also share with you all some of my credentials in case certain individuals are curious about these resources. So this is through Hope Valley Counseling. It's located in the UK, and that's Jilly Jenkinson that teaches that. And that work of hers is actually based on research that she did for her PhD, that program. Also, because you all will be familiar with Dr. Marlene Wynell, I am a part of her Helping Professionals group, also host of the Project Hope podcast, and I work with clients, as Janet Me Janice mentioned. I have an embodiment class coming up that's trauma-informed, um, also a course on recovery from high demand, high control groups in September, and you can grab all information on me at my website. Um, other little fun factoids that people sometimes like to know about, I was a home birth midwife for nine years and I do have a master's. So a little bit about my cult. So I apologize if this term is offensive to some in the context of religion. So I'll share the distinction that's felt helpful to me, that some cults are disguised as religious, and this was certainly the case with mine, um, with tax-exempt tax status and all. And um, the other is that some established religions become cults or have cult fractions due to the group mindset and often leadership within the community. So all of that is to say that cults, religions, psychological manipulation, spiritual abuse all happen on a spectrum and can also be experienced differently by different people in the same community. So there are a lot of factors here, and that's why we're going to focus on coercive control and eight established methods of coercion um, that we'll explore so that you can really assess for yourself and hopefully learn a little something about what to look out for and prevent abuse before serious harm is done. So in order to do all that, I realized it might be helpful to give you a little personal context uh, because I will use myself as an example. So I was in a Christian mystical group um, from 2001 until 2012, I served as a priest. I ran two centers. I was in New York City. I had an arranged marriage in that organization, and I had no communication with my family for about eight years. Uh, the story of how I got in and out is in episodes one and two of my podcast, in case anybody wants more of that. Okay, so why are we talking about coercive control? So in my master's program on the subject, everyone in that program has a focus in one of a few categories, domestic abuse and intimate partner violence. And this is where we actually see coercive control being enacted into law present day, uh, sex trafficking. So the relationship between kind of a pimp and a victim, gangs, cults, which of course come in many flavors. Um, so interestingly enough and applicable to this group, of course, is that we are now identifying church behaviors that have long been viewed as benign 
or even healthy as malignant. We know that when religion is forceful, it can be terrorizing, impacting how we relate to others, to ourselves, and how we relate to God. Survivors report lasting impacts upon safety, identity, aut autonomy, and their attachment to others. So really core survival and wellness elements there. Of course, with the lack of societal understanding comes isolation for the victim and results in a society that doesn't recognize predatory and authoritarian control. Coercive control is very difficult to identify. Without outward violence, it's particularly difficult to recognize abuse. Victims miss the signs of emotional abuse. We really have a tendency to see the best in people or environments that we want to see the best in, church in particular. Um, church, there's group reinforcement, which can be very powerful. And I've also noticed tendencies in churches in particular, probably due to the messaging, that many of us internalize that something's wrong with us and then redouble efforts to be good. So my hope, if we understand the tactics of coercive control, we hold the possibility to protect ourselves and others. So this includes small, subtle, so coercive control includes small, subtle, petty and seemingly insignificant manipulative behaviors that are played out and repeated over time. That's an important element. And interspersed with changing tactics and generous, kind, and loving acts and behaviors, which gradually brainwash the victim whilst remaining almost completely undetectable to everyone else. Simultaneously, an abuser, which might be found in leadership, the group, or the teachings, you can kind of use your own interpretation there, work to undermine the victim's self-belief, the belief in self. And this really is a work to break the trust between an individual also and their friends and family by making them other or non-relatable in some way. Okay, so I wanted to just take a quick moment because I acknowledge that this topic may be challenging and I thought I'd take a minute to just offer a couple of suggestions as you're listening to me. As you approach this content and are possibly considering your church, just remember that these things can be very difficult to identify. So um, you might question or suspend any automated internalized rebuttals that you've heard as a part of church language or rebuttals from management, meaning like pastors, leaders, um, and it may, sorry, it may also be helpful to take notes. Um, if you have an area that I'm talking about that you feel triggered by, you can return to it later. And what we're about to explore, I have personally experienced. So I present this with the deepest compassion and with an understanding that hopefully helps you approach this content and perhaps your own experience with some new understanding and without judgment. So our focus for this presentation is really on the psychological. So let's take a look at religion through the lens of Albert Biderman's work and his psychological analysis and methods used to coerce information and false confession. So his research is all around prisoners of war that were captured by communist forces during um, the Korean War and his work with the prisoners of war around the coerce, coercion, coercion that they experienced. Oops. Number one, isolation. So this is the first method and the effect and purpose is depriving an individual's social support, which effectively inhibits that person's ability to resist makes the individual dependent on the perpetrator and develops an intense concern with self, meaning an individual begins to internalize and monitor themselves according to the rules. So how might this present in religious communities? The creation of a close-knit spiritual community that separates believers from non-believers. There's typically language around this. Theology that supports us versus them 
hierarchical structure that's gender-based, offering freebies or assistance to individuals who are not doing well, creating dependency. So this is the key here in terms of um, the negative element, creating dependency such that the member believes they cannot survive outside of the group. Also requirements of address code, extinguishing people's voices by insisting upon conformity, secrecy, and silence. And I thought I'd just mention here, be sure not to mistake confession as sort of a rebuttal for the silence or secrecy, because this can be another manipulative tactic. So what you need to evaluate here is beyond confession. Um, it's more like, is there room to question or remain in disagreement with what you're being told and still be fully accepted? So no community slights or ostracization. And what one reveals in confession, and again, this may look different in different environments, um, is not for others. Uh, so in its purest form, it's a ritual of unburdening and should never be revealed by pastors to others without your explicit approval and should not be used in public. So that's another dynamic to pay attention to if this is being done subtly or not, even from the pulpit, causing shame or calling people out. Oh, so sorry. Okay, so monopolization of perception. So the effect of this is that it fixes the attention of the victim on the immediate predicament, fostering introspection. And so this actually inhibits one's ability to hope, plan, or resist. So this is that just describing kind of the way these some of these tactics work. Also, it eliminates information not in compliance with the demands of the group, which reinforces also omnipotence of the perpetrator if, if there's a leader. Um, and it causes friction for actions not cons consistent with compliance. How might this present? Repetitive indoctrination process. So sermons constantly reinforcing select scripture passages for scripture memorization attending church multiple times a week for bible studies services rituals possibly narrow edu narrow religious education and vilifying or demonizing of otherness discouragement or forbidding of secular education which sometimes results in homeschooling or certain types of books music entertainment so that the correct beliefs get airtime. And again, that's sort of the thing to focus on, that restriction there, the, the idea behind the restriction that correct beliefs are being enforced. Discrediting anyone questioning, so gaslighting, double binds, unspoken or spoken threats of rejection. Um, this also includes monitoring. I wanted to include that one in there where we were kind of trained to spy or tattle to help someone to be on the right path. Um, discrediting of outsiders and family or friends who question the spiritual group's belief or behavior patterns. Okay. I hope you're all still with me. I know it's a lot. Humiliation and degradation. The effect here is this, of course, makes resistance more costly than compliance. And here we're really looking at basic human level concerns again, basic needs being unmet, like survival elements. So after this isolation and monopolizing of perception and discrediting others that I just mentioned, it remains necessary to discredit the individual themselves or an entire class of people. And that's referring to those who don't believe, um, you know, again, that us them thing. This will often happen through words and actions so that individuals are gradually drained of self-esteem, self-respect and personal agency. And this can also result in creating a fear of freedom as well as dependency. It can weaken their physical, mental and emotional ability to resist. And again, this can reinforce feelings of helplessness. So the individual becomes comfortable in this diminished state. Also worn down by being treated in demeaning ways, so possibly ridiculed for having needs, 
or independent perceptions, possibly mocked, labeled in derogatory terms, and given subservient tasks. And this actually helps to develop a lack of faith in the individual's own capabilities. So this process conditions targeted victims to accept increasingly unacceptable behavior without complaint. In other words, what we might once have what might once have been shocking behavior becomes normalized. How this might present publicly exposing an individual's vulnerabilities or weaknesses under the guise of prayer or saving their soul, targeting individuals for exorcism or ostracization, ostracism. And uh, the exorcism element that might sound probably not to this group, it might sound a little far out or crazy, but you hear this in uh, the podcast that was done just recently about Mars Hill, um, which I highly recommend. Um, and ostracism, obviously, the disobedient ones is the message that's being given to the group. Depriving individuals of sleep, meals, or special privileges. And again, just to use myself to express the power that these methods can hold in my circumstance. In the beginning, when I was in my group, my parents actually addressed this with me. They were questioning my sleep and my schedule, which was very, very demanding, uh, such that they were questioning it. And I couldn't even see it because I felt so amazing discovering a high level of productivity for the first time in my 20s. And I thought I was learning and gaining important skills like discipline and focus. So also denying individuals participation in group activities, such as um, kicking them off the mission trip or not inviting them to the group picnic, special exclusive groups within the church, um, and also demanding members be submissive no matter how badly they're being treated. Induce debilitation and exhaustion. So the victim becomes worn out by levels of tension and fear and by constantly attempting to read the perpetrator and their behavior while simultaneously avoid expressing fear, sorrow, or rage to avoid further consequences from the perpetrator. In religious communities, this might present as an expectation of members to attend services or be on committees that interfere with their ordinary life. If you're questioning that also, maybe try on like what would happen if you said no and participated less. That's a good gauge. Also being pressed into service to the group that consumes large amounts of time, leaving little time for self-care or reflection. And again, in my own experience, I actually believed that I had self-time, but my self-time was one hour of meditation every morning, a personal exercise, evening prayers, and quiet time. So again, just the perspective shift and difference when you're in or out. Um, it also might promote endless striving, so one can never do enough, be enough, or be good enough. This is often experienced by leading members, so those who are kind of the elite of the group, um, who are often drained in one or all of the areas, financially, emotionally, psychologically, and mentally. Encouragement to have more children than women would like or can care for. And of course, all moms experience, you know, extraordinary exhaustion. But again, this is really a shift based on the messaging that's being received. Prolonged periods of fasting, prayer and worship, promoting double bind messages. So this is a situation in which a person is confronted with two irreconcilable demands or a choice between two undesirable courses of action. And the double bind induces a feeling of really being crazy and fosters mental exhaustion. Two examples of this that we might find in church settings are that members are required to guard or promote an idealized public image 
that's directly contradicted by a harsher private reality of behaviors and the real rules that are kind of secret. Or it might look like the discouragement to take prescribed medications or other therapies, often accompanied by guilt-inducing explanations like, One's face should be enough to heal or sustain, thus putting an individual in a position whereby they must choose either their health by going to the doctor, which will put them in the position of being a weak believer, or deny their health to maintain a good faith standing. Threats. The effect of this is that they create anxiety and despair, and they may be overt or subtle, but they're intended to make the abuser's expectations clear. Um, they induce fear of consequences for challenging the authority or erratic behavior of abusive individuals. And this is often done through biblical teachings or spiritual principles, of course. How might this present overt blackmail, such as threatening to explo- expose a perceived sin or worse yet, a confessed sin? Threats or displays of aggression, physical dominance and violence. And unfortunately, this does happen. I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir, so to speak. (laughs) But as an example, I've had actually a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses share with me that it was the court case that the Australian government brought against leadership for child abuse that actually allowed them to break mentally from the beliefs and teachings. Passive aggressive behavior through comments like it would be a shame to lose you as a valid leader or member. So kind of a veiled threat that sounds caring, but pressures you with a clear negative consequence. And back to the point about being crippled to challenge leadership, authority and spiritual teachings around things like thou shalt not question God's representative on earth as he is beyond question. And therefore, so are his representatives and any demands they might voice. Occasional indulgences. This one's really interesting, I think. The effect of it is that occasional indulgences, which reinforce the omnipotence traitor, so they may also seek favor from them and provide positive motivation for compliance. This also hinders an adjustment to deprivation that would awaken the individual to the abuse. Again, back to these considerations of like why it's so hard to kind of track these things or see them. So allow me to use myself as an example, and you can listen here for the double bind as well. In regards to isolation from my family, the summary is right away, the teachers, the priests were trying to separate me. And I believe this was due to the closeness that they felt between me and my family. And my priest actually seen that as a threat for control over me. As I went in and out of awareness regarding kind of how messed up this was and this message was that was being put on me, they would pressure and entrap me with the carrot of ministry. And if I didn't break ties with my family, I was attached and I therefore couldn't serve. That pressure was incredibly heavy. And yet they'd use this to prove how messed up or attached I was because they were open to me seeing my family, which they would verbalize, and were in no way holding me back. I was free to do exactly as I wanted. That was verbalized to me. So early on, there were occasional instances when I would see family, but the repercussions were then severe and the repercussions were my fault because I was continually proving how attached I was in my agreement to see them. So how might this present again? Give the person just enough favor, love, or reward to keep them in the fold or from seeing the perpetrator as an abuser. Reinforce that a person should feel grateful for what you have and guilty if they aren't appreciative. This indoctrination keeps a person from focusing objectively on how little they are actually given. Seven. So omnipotence and omniscience. 
this has the this the, the effect of this actually it suggests a futility of resistance or cripples people and provides leadership with power control and superiority some religious communities this might come in demonstrations of shock and awe, such as performing alleged miracles, claiming to receive visions or special dreams. Um, and often this is used to determine things for others. So in my case, um, the visions or whatever you want to call them for me by my teachers resulted in an arranged marriage, career changes, up and moving to a new city to open a new center um, and parents with priest parents who had children did this tearing their kids away from their friends and environments overwhelming displays of force or disproportional consequences such as dramatically ejecting a member from the community for sincere questions or for their note of hypocrisy and leadership also separating family members as punishment. And I believe this is often also a test of loyalty to the leader um, or to the group in some way. Um, so for example, in my group, it was not so much uh, punishment as it was a, a test of uh, loyalty to the spiritual teachings. Cruelly or publicly making an example of a member in a power play to demonstrate superiority. So in my group, this was done all the time at community meals or gatherings. So everyone knew what was what the possible repercussions could be. And it left no doubt about the leadership's power to enforce those repercussions. Open committing of crimes by authority figures. And I would just put sexual abuse into this category and it not being held accountable often in churches. I'm obviously not going to get into that. It's a whole topic in and of itself, um, but a particularly devastating one. Indulgence and in hypocrisies are treating others in ways nobody else could get away with. Okay, and the last one here is enforcing trivial demands. So this develops a habit of compliance and thus naturally leads to the group compliance with rules and thus enables punishment for non-compliance with the rules. But also I'd say that especially in religious spiritual communities, it also enforces having a good attitude while doing something that one might otherwise never agree to spending their precious time doing. And the more one bypasses their emotions, the easier it becomes to do so. And as it becomes easier to disassociate from our feelings, the easier it is to not notice we're being manipulated. Bummer. So this might present in religious environments with the reinforcement of who has the power and who does not by the making of kind of patently silly demands that serve little apparent useful purpose such as unnecessary manual labor or making you apologize to your abuser. This often shows up in religious communities around forced and laborious writing exercises too. It often shows up in rigid and unrealistic rules as well as punishments for non-compliance with the rules. I find these are often particular to the group or leadership. These rules often govern the victim's appearance, housekeeping. So like this would include cleaning the church and being asked to vacuum the carpet so the lines are in a certain direction. Or in my case, we were taught exactly how to clean everything in our novice houses and the top line of the baseboard needed to be done. So again, these things are just are a little nitpicky, but it expands to parenting, to timelines. Um, also frequent changes to the rules, and this really results in mind games. And these demands of questioned are often met with stop, thought stopping responses. Um, these are often commonly used phrases and sometimes passing as folk wisdom and kind of everyday, the everyday world. But it's the use of these phrases to propagate cognitive dissonance. 
So the phrase in and of itself may be, you know, valid in certain contexts or applicable, but it's the application as a means of dismissing dissent or justifying false logic is what really makes it stop terminating. So it becomes the start and finish of any ideological analysis, right? So it's God's will. That's not for you to question or you need to have faith. And that's it. I wanted to just give you all um, some of the resources here that are incredible on coercive control. Of course, Biderman's chart of coercion are the eight elements that I just took you through. Robert J. Lifton was one of Biderman's contemporaries, also incredible work there, uh, research. And of course, I had to mention Evan Stark because he has really brought the terminology of coercive control into the awareness of the domestic abuse arena. And again, as I mentioned, you can see here, in case any of you are interested, I want to just share where coercive control legislation is at. And I figured I could just keep this slide up as I receive questions. That's great, Jennifer. Thank you. That was so um, interesting. You covered so many uh, really interesting elements of this topic. And I found myself thinking a lot about um, my family of origin and the way that I was raised. So I had never considered it a family cult or anything that extreme, but definitely some of these tactics were used by my very religious uh, narcissistic father in particular to try and keep us uh, in line and make sure that we were believing exactly what he wanted us to believe. So not allowed to really feel things. We could only express happiness or maybe sadness, never anger or displeasure. And then I wondered also about um, the dynamic of codependency and narcissism when it comes to those personal relationships with coercive control uh, showing up there. Yes. And it's it's so typical, Janice, that narcissists will use these tactics. And that's that's really why it's so cool the way you processed it and kind of hearing it also through the familial lens, because that was really my hope with this is for people to sort of understand these principles, because we really can try them on in all these different situations or circumstances, relationships. Um, you know, and this is where part of my heart always goes out to, can we teach this to children in, you know, before they even get to college? So they just have some foundation of yeah. stuff to look for, you know, because it really, it shows up in one-to-one -one relationships. It shows up in group dynamics. Yes, uh, that's so true. Um, yeah, if we could have it taught to uh, kids in high school as they're preparing to leave home and go to college and university where they're exceptionally vulnerable uh, to some of these groups. And I see that we do have a question or two that have popped in here. And I'll just ask you, can you talk about whether you notice any coercive control factors in some fringe high control kundalini yoga groups or other places in the health and wellness spheres? Excellent question. Well, that was spot on because <laughs> I actually didn't put this in my uh, biographical information, but I am a certified kundalini yoga instructor oh. because after I left my cult, I hopped into the kundalini cult. <laughs> now, I don't mean to be disrespectful in that regard. My experience there has been that um, I believe that the original origins of that group were extraordinarily abusive. And there have, some of you may may or may not be familiar with this, but I think it was just kind of prior to COVID time, I actually interviewed a woman named Pamela Dyson on my podcast because she was basically the whistleblower um, and didn't really realize that it would blow things up in the way that it did. 
because she was one of Yogi Bhajan's original and very close students. So this is always now, to be totally honest, for me personally, and again, other people have their different radars or red flags, but anytime there's any dynamic of a student-teacher relationship, um, and that really is the model that I was raised in. My, Although we were Christian, um, it was a student-teacher relationship modeled after Eastern schools. And there were a lot of Eastern teachings as well and Eastern rituals and very meditation heavy. So what I've kind of concluded around this is, again, if we really pay attention to these elements of coercive control, I really imagine that they might serve as protection. And when we're encountering groups, because we all need this, right? I mean, that's why I then hopped to Kundalini Yoga. Mm -hmm. um, once I actually saw Yogi Bhajan, who started it and, you know, was in my teacher training, had to watch this whole video of him, I nearly lost my cookies that day because my reaction was so strong to it. I mean, I just, right away, he felt exactly like my, um, my mystical teacher. <laughs> so, um, you know, to each his own, I think it's a really tough question when something um, has origins that are abusive. Um, and yet I've seen people do really beautiful things. You know, I have a ton of Kundalini yoga teacher, instructor friends who are definitely just doing yoga, you know, mm -hmm. and, and there isn't a whole culture around it mm -hmm. and a whole and pressure around it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I hope that answered the question. Yes, I think that was wonderful. And we all definitely have this innate desire for acceptance. If we attend a yoga class, we want to be noticed by the teacher as having proper form or whatever the things are. Um, this The need for acceptance is just one of the things that can make us all very vulnerable to falling into um, these dynamics. We do have another question here. Um, yeah, and I would say just quickly, Janice, to sort yeah. of rip off of that. Mm -hmm. Also, the other real thing to pay attention to is because, again, when you get involved in these things and it's a um, a wellness thing of some sort, yeah. typically your life is changing, right? Whatever it is, you're losing weight, you're no longer drinking or wanting to participate in similar activities that you once did. And so the thing... I also think it's a really good gauge to just kind of check in around the the relationships that once were. Are you ditching old relationships because of this new environment? And is that necessary? And why is it happening? Is it a pressure or is it, you know, really just a conscious decision that you are independently making? Again, you know, just particular to the individual. That is such kind of a, oh, that's such a great uh, suggestion for people to be, to keep an eye on that, on the relationship aspect. Um, and it strikes me as well that uh, these sorts of issues can come up in multi-level marketing, MLM um, communities and situations as well, where there's an inordinate uh, amount of pressure applied so that all your time and resources uh, belong to the uh, MLM company. Got another question or two here. Um, someone has asked, how can therapists help people start to separate from coercive control? Mm, great question. Okay, so one of my very favorite concepts, that's kind of what I begin with um, in this work is, around evaluating, this is actually, I think it's a gestalt term. I'm not a gestalt therapist, um, but it's a gestalt concept. And that is um, of introjects. And you can look up that definition, but essentially what it is, it's when we take messages or beliefs of people or things outside of us and make them our own in an unconscious way. So kind of back to what Janice was saying about the family unit, you know, the family unit that you're, you're going to grow up in, 
it may not be until you're 25 that all of a sudden you realize there's some message that you were given that was never that you then interpreted and and um and felt shame around and all of a sudden you realize wait a second i'm feeling this shame i carry this shame this message was never even mine it's not me it was something i interpreted kind of from this outside world and i've been carrying it and it causes discomfort this is the particular interject that we're talking about right so i love this concept because i think it's and it's actually a little bit what i was doing when i shared that little slide of like um just some suggestions of maybe how to listen as you're with me in this um, presentation that if you can detect reactions inside of yourself, you can then evaluate them. Like th the things, uh, Jilly Jenkinson talks about this principle as a belief or something that you've taken in that is like unchewed food. It sits just not right mm -hmm. in the belly. And that's kind of the tip off to it's there, but it's an incredible way to begin to even look at some of these messages and detach from them. So to go like, what are these beliefs that I've taken in? And then once we've got a list of those beliefs that you've taken in that are causing pain, you know, or some sort of negativity, they're mm -hmm. undigested, they don't feel good. Then we look at, what's the truth about that in a really real way that makes sense to you right so let me use the riff off the shame example maybe in that shame example there's a still a little bit of truth for me about that then that's how i counter it i just go 90 percent of that 90 percent of that shame that i'm carrying was because my priest gave me this message 10% of that shame, I might be partly responsible for it. And then you can sit with that. And, and we would evaluate the 10% yeah. that you maybe are responsible for, but to really separate and to start to understand what the truth is. Because of course, I come from a background of internal family systems where we really hold, um, this kind of principle that all parts of us, right, all thoughts, all feelings, nothing's bad. It's all welcomed because once it's expressed and we can see it and feel it, we can start to understand it and unpack it. And there's always a reason, you know, we're all, even the extreme behaviors, they're just trying to protect some element of our system. Mm -hmm. And once that gets unpacked, you know, we start to untangle. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Great, uh, great answers there. Thoughtful, thoughtful tools that you're giving us. We're, we're um, winding down just to our last uh, minute or so here. Um, some folks have asked about uh, the slides that you put together, about the PowerPoint. People have been asking if there's a way that they could um, access those, or maybe you prefer they just access them through the recording. That's also fine, but I'll just leave that uh, with you. And for those who have questions that we didn't have time to get to, I hope you'll join us at the Court Cafe uh, just a few minutes after we're done here because Jennifer is also going to be coming into the court cafe and you can ask her some questions and just interact with her there. Isn't that right, Jennifer? Yes. And I'm more than happy to share the presentation. I suspect it'll be up, but if anybody wants to just email me or get in touch, please do. Okay, and you and you included that contact information uh, right at the beginning there. Um, and also you have the name of your uh, podcast included there as well. I want to make sure that people yes. are familiar with that. So oh, it was such a joy learning from you tonight. Thank you for this excellent information. And I hope Thanks everybody's going to join here. us. Yes, what a delight. Okay, folks, uh, hopefully we'll see you in just a few minutes in the Court Cafe. We're looking forward to it.